Okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to the seventh annual uh, Media Literacy Week, obviously hosted by the National Association for Media Literacy Education. Uh, we're here to talk a little bit about the Cyber Citizenship Initiative. Um, I'm Nate Fisk. I'm Assistant Professor of Cybersecurity Education at the University of South Florida, and I'm also the uh, Cyber Florida Community and Outreach Director. Um, and I've been with this project since the beginning. And in short, the Cyber Citizenship Initiative is a uh, developing platform where we're attempting to address the complex issues of mis, dis, and mal information, which I'm sure we'll, we may get into talking a little bit about more uh, as we talk with our panelists this evening. But in short, that this project is a collaborative effort between New America, Cyber Florida, and the National Association for Media Literacy Education. Um, with the general idea that the kind of emerging complexity of these kinds of problems requires new kinds of solutions and approaches, and that more specifically, it needs something a little bit more, more agile and flexible than uh, some of the more static resources that we've had in the past. So the idea behind the project is that we would build a large scale curricular repository in order to support educators who are working to uh, educate students on these issues and ideally provide with some level of defense. But um, a, in addition to that, we'll be curating all of those resources in terms of various educational standards and alignment to different kinds of um, educational subject areas. Um, but Beyond the curricula and materials themselves, um, one of our big pushes was to develop a much larger community of practice around these kinds of issues. Um, namely, because we believe that these newer issues of mis, dis, and malinformation are something that sits at the intersection of media literacy education, national security, and cybersecurity. So in part here this evening, what we're doing is we're bringing together some of the um, content developers who have materials listed within our curricular repository in the hopes that we'll all kind of have a discussion about the kinds of things um, that they are working on currently and the ways in which that their materials kind of interface with these ideas of media literacy, cybersecurity, and national security, uh, all kind of focused around these ideas of, of issues with mis, uh, mal, and disinformation. So with that, I'm going to quickly introduce all of our panelists this evening, and then we'll go from there. Uh, each one of our panelists will kind of have a quick moment to describe the kinds of materials that they're working on. And then we're gonna spend about half an hour for Q&A at the end of our discussion. So first up, and I'm going to go down in the order in which we'll be uh, having a quick discussion with each of our panelists is Kelly Mendoza, who is Vice President of Education uh, Programs at Common Sense Education. She's developed research-based award-winning curricula in digital citizenship, media literacy, information literacy, and social emotional learning. Uh, she's developed curricula and resources for classroom champions, resilient educator, Lucas Learning, and the Media Education Lab. Kelly has a PhD in media and communication from Temple University. Thank you for joining us tonight, Kelly. Um, next is Joel Breakstone who's the director of the Stanford History Education Group. He leads Sheg's efforts to research, develop, and disseminate free curricula and assessments, overseeing the creation of the civic online reasoning curricula, which helps students sort fact from fiction online using the strategies of professional fact checkers. Uh, the curriculum won a Global Media and Information Literacy Award from UNESCO in 2020, and he's also received a PhD from the Stanford Graduate School of Education. Melissa Dark has over 20 years of experience in cybersecurity education, our third presenter this evening, ranging from studying the effect of various representational forms on cryptography learning and neural connections to developing cybersecurity concept lessons for integration in the Advanced Placement Computer Science Principles High School course. Uh, over these past 20 years, uh, Melissa's work has progressively grown in scope to encompass everything from high school up into graduate school, uh, and primarily in response to two needs, robust cybersecurity literacy among all cyber citizens and closing the cybersecurity workforce gap. In 2015, she founded Dark Enterprises Incorporated, a nonprofit which advances the mission of developing, supporting, and stewarding cybersecurity education initiatives in the United States. All right. And with that, um, I'm going to kick things off with you, Kelly. Would you like to tell us a little bit more about the, the programs at Common Sense that you're involved in? Yes, well, th thank you, Nathan. Thanks and happy Media Literacy Week. Uh, I'm so happy to be on this presentation today and hope you're all um, engaged in celebrating and 
media literacy or global media literacy. And I do have, I'm gonna share my screen for just a few overview, but I first wanna thanks, say thanks to um, the Cyber Citizenship Initiative and the hub um, in particular for um, inviting us to be, oh, I'm gonna go back, to be a part of this initiative. Um, and I can kind of tell you a little bit about Common Sense, a little bit about the resources that are featured in the hub and how it might fit into this larger um, cyber citizenship. And um, I just wanna foreshadow that all of these resources are available for free to educators. Um, so Common Sense Education, some Common Sense Media is a nonprofit and everything we do is around supporting young people to be learners, leaders, and citizens in the digital age. We also have a lot of parent education resources and um, free curriculum for educators. So I, I'll explain where I think this falls into the cyber citizenship uh, framework. But what we what we do, uh, what we focus on at Common Sense and is digital citizenship. And I, I oversee the programmatic content that we develop for schools and the curriculum. And so we see this as, um, using technology responsibly to learn, create, and participate. And as part of that, news and media literacy is a core skill set, but there's a whole other uh, types of skill sets as well that fit into this um, that we think all work together. So in terms of where I think common sense resources can fall for those educators out there looking for resources or you're supporting the schools and districts that you're in, it is uh, more squarely in the citizenship and media literacy space. And I'll just highlight this for you because I think we're all together and can we're bringing resources that are coming from different places um, and probably less so explicitly in the cybersecurity um, space. So um, what we focus on is digital citizenship and media literacy as core competencies of um, participating as a global citizen in today's day and age. And um, one of the things I'll highlight, although the Cyber Citizenship Hub, there's a lot of great resources from a lot of great um, organizations, and we have a few, but this is kind of our core pillar resource that addresses news and media literacy as one of the six uh, topics. But um, it's been in the field for many, many years, and we've, we've iterated it on this curriculum um, throughout the years of the digital citizenship curriculum. And we work closely with Carrie James and Emily Weinstein at Harvard uh, Project Zero. They do research on young people and digital media and sort of the ethical fault lines that um, kids are falling into. And their research has guided us throughout all these years and also the educational approaches that we take. Um, common sense, we're also known for our family resources. So everything we do has a family engagement component because we know that these issues carry over from school to home and um, especially over the last years, kids did um, uh, school, you know, at home or now they have devices. It's just um, parents are eager for resources on these things as well. And I'll just point out that um, our resources are available for free, thanks to our philanthropic funders, and that the, the digital citizenship curriculum is one of many different resources that the hub is pointing to but that um, it's K to 12 and we offer um, free lesson plans, videos, and we've tried to um, really make them classroom friendly in a way that you could just pick up and run with it. That you don't, we, we expect teachers not to necessarily have a lot of background. They wanna teach this, they know it's important, um, but they may not know where to begin and may even feel um, we do hear from teachers that they shy away from these things. They may not be familiar with all the social media platforms or the media that their students are using. And that's not necessarily the case. They don't need to be completely familiar. It's more about these underlying issues um, that we teach of these six core topics. So um, all of our, our six core topics are related to the research on the, the biggest, biggest pain points that are facing kids um, today's day and age, and a lot of these intersect with each other. So you can see news and media literacy is one core topic, but it also intersects with privacy issues, but it also intersects with um, cyberbullying and hate speech um, or digital footprint. And media balance is something that um, kids struggle with, and we kind of didn't have a choice over the last year around just being um, on your device all day. So um, the news and media literacy piece is, um, I'm going to dive into a couple examples from that and the cyber, cyber bullying and hate speech, because 
as we consume news, I think there's a whole skill set around analysis, you know, analyzing misinformation, disinformation, and being able to fact check and have a skill set around understanding the information you're consuming. But there's also a whole skill set around dialogue about the issues that we're encountering and very polarized dialogue that we see online and making sense of that. And I think we we bring a lot of the of both of those sides. And I, I just wanna point out that, um, you know, as we encounter news and a lot of it's around politics or things happening in the world and America's very divided on a lot of issues, um, you know, part of what we have to teach students is to how to have civil dialogue around these issues as they participate in social media and make sense of everything. Um, so we do have several lessons that I wanna point out just this sort of um, angle on news and media literacy is around how do we have civil dialogue? So we address issues around hate speech, um, around you know how to have disagreements, how does that carry out online and how do you communicate online that's maybe in different ways than you would face to face and, and carry out those conversations. Um, we have hand, handouts and resources all on Google Docs. So if you use that, you could either download or add to your drive and, and adapt the resources for your student population. Um, and here's just an example. Even if you have 10 or 15 minutes, you can still teach these issues um, with, with students. And so this is an example where we have a short video with Cameron Kasky. He's an anti um, He's an anti-gun activist that came out of the March for Our Lives movement, and he's talking about his experience having um, uncivil or civil dialogue about a very contentious issue of gun safety and gun control. And then we have students um, talk about that. And you can even have a pretty powerful conversation and just even if you have a few minutes, because I know teachers are completely um, overwhelmed as trapped um, for time, especially um, coming back to school this fall. Um, I just want to mention in terms of impact, so I have a lot of stats here, um, some are from teachers and some are from students. Um, we, I've, I've listed our student confidence levels around, um, and this is just looking at sixth grade, around um, some of the outcomes from our lessons, but um, a lot of students feel, you know, more confident dealing with these issues or more confident in acting or applying the skills that we're teaching, for instance, um, the last one, 93% of students say they're confident in being able to check the credibility of what they read online. Um, and then we have some um, teacher feedback as well. Um, and these are teachers that, that we've reached out to that are using our resources around feeling like um, their students are learning digital citizenship skills and um, agreeing that the resources are all, also helping parents as well. So um, I just want to give you that high level pitch. Um, and if you're looking for how to get started or where to get started, you can go to commonsense.org, go to the education section, and we have free online training and, and ways to get started. And, um, you know, I really hope these resources help support the Cyber Citizenship Hub and the initiative. Um, and they're all free and available to you. And I'm happy to answer any questions later. Thank All you. right, thank you very much, Kelly. Um, next up, we have Joel Breakstone. Joel, off to you. Thanks so much, Nate and uh, Nathan, and thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, I really appreciate it and looking forward to telling you a little bit about our civic online reasoning materials. Um, we are a research group at, based at the Graduate School of Education at Stanford. And, and we've been focusing on trying to support students to be more discerning consumers of online information. Unfortunately, there is a pretty uh, durable popular perception that young people are well equipped to evaluate online sources because they have grown up with digital devices. Last year, Politico released a study or an article saying that um, to be sure, Gen Z does not need lessons on how to use the internet. They aren't falling for the same stories, uh, fake news stories that may have duped their parents in 2016. Um, 
Our research, however, shows quite the contrary. Um, we uh, recently conducted a survey of more than 3,000 high school students from all across the country, and we asked them to evaluate real online sources with a live internet connection. And the results were troubling, to say the least. Uh, one of the tasks asked students to actually look at a Facebook video. Uh, it was uh, purporting to show voter fraud in the 2016 Democratic uh, presidential election primaries. Uh, and the, the uh, subject line says, have you ever noticed that Democrats are the only ones uh, ever caught uh, committing voter fraud? Um, students had a live internet connection. At any time, they could leave and search online uh, about this source. Um, uh, and if they had done that search, they would have found sources like this one. There's a Snopes article saying that, nope, this is definitely not showing voter fraud. Uh, and perhaps even more convincing, a BBC article that said that the footage that appears in that Facebook video was from a story that they put together about voter fraud in Russia. And that's where it really came from. It had nothing to do with voter fraud in the United States. Despite that, out of those more than 3,000 students, only three students made that connection to the voter fraud uh, or to the real source of this uh, video that it was Russian. Um, in fact, most students said that it was convincing evidence of voter fraud in the United States. And the majority of the rest of the students said that it wasn't good uh, evidence, but for inaccurate reasons. Things like, I need to see more video, but they didn't get at this key question of where's this information actually coming from? So the question is, how can we help students do better? What are a set of skills that we can teach students that will allow them to be more effective consumers of online information? And to figure that out, we set out to do research about expertise in online evaluations. And we asked three groups of people to evaluate a series of sources. And those groups were freshmen at Stanford University, historians, uh, PhD uh, academics who were uh, all in uh, research universities, and professional fact checkers from the nation's leading uh, newspapers and magazines. And we recorded their screens as they evaluated a series of different sources. And some striking differences emerged in terms of how these groups of people uh, evaluated the sites. One of them was the, an article from the website Minimum Wage Dot com. And in general, the Stanford freshmen and the historians scrolled up and down on this article and they looked for markers of credibility. They saw that it was well formatted. It has recent information. It's run by an organization, the Employment Policies Institute, that has a .org website and 501c3 status and uh, purports to put out nonpartisan research. However, the fact checkers approached the website very, very differently. Instead of reading it carefully, almost immediately they left the website and turned to the broader web to see what other sources said about the minimumwage.com and the Employment Policies Institute, the group that runs it. And when they did that, they found out that the website is actually run by a guy named Rick Berman who uh, runs a public relations firm that is employed by the food and beverage industry, people who have a vested interest in keeping minimum wage low. Uh, so that's not gonna be the best source of information to learn about minimum wage policy. The fact checkers always found this information. Every single one of them figured that out. Only 60% of the historians ever found the connection to Rick Berman, and only 40% of the Stanford students did. Uh, and the fact checkers did it much faster. If young people can't figure out this kind of information, who's behind a website trying to influence public policy, our democracy is in trouble. We need to make sure that people have credible information to uh, base their decisions. And this, one of the things that stood out to us from this research was that to understand a website, you need to leave it. In a, in a system like our current uh, information ecosystem, uh, there is so much information, there's an overabundance that we shouldn't devote our attention to websites that aren't deserving of our attention. Instead, we should conserve our attention for sites that are more credible. And so what we have sought to do is to turn the research that we did with fact checkers into a curriculum that we refer to as the civic online reasoning curriculum that can help students become more skilled at finding the information they need to make decisions that will affect themselves and their communities.
And the curriculum is based around the three questions that we saw guiding the fact checkers approach to online information, which were who's behind the information, what's the evidence, and what do other sources say. We uh, made the curriculum materials and then we tested them in uh, a large Midwestern school district. Uh, and we randomly assigned uh, high school students to two conditions. Some students completed civic online reasoning lessons and others just did their normal 12th grade government class. And what we found was that the students in the civic online reasoning classrooms did better uh, from pretest to post-test on evaluating real sources, those same kinds of questions that we gave to students all across the country. So this is just showing scores from pretest to post-test um, out of uh, a total of 14. So those kids in the civic online reasoning classrooms uh, significantly improved. The materials are now all available for free on our website, which is cor.stanford.edu. Uh, on the website, you'll find the curriculum materials uh, sortable by those three big questions of who's behind the, uh, the information, what's the evidence, and what do other sources say. There are also curriculum collections on the website where you can seek out sources that are uh, all about the same topic. So if you want to teach this key move of lateral reading that we saw the fact checkers engaging with, of leaving a site to turn to the broader web, there are a set of lessons and assessments all on that topic. There are all of the assessments that we've used in uh, our various studies as, as well as in the curriculum are also available on the website. Those are all delivered as Google Forms, so you can make a version of it and then use that with students. We also have a set of videos, both short instructional videos that are for teachers or parents about how you might use and teach these skills, as well as classroom videos showing what these lessons look like in real classrooms. And then finally, a set of 10 videos that we made in collaboration with John Green and his team at Crash Course that are all focused on these skills as well uh, and take up uh, the moves of, of lateral reading and examining uh, the source information more carefully. So uh, I look forward to hearing the conversation, um, but also please don't hesitate to reach out if I can answer any questions along the way. Thank you. All right. Thanks again, Joel. Uh, that's excellent. Really glad to hear about some of these resources. And last, Melissa, I'll pass things off to you. All right. Thank you so much, Nathan. I really enjoyed um, listening to you, Kelly, and I knew about Common Sense Media. I've worked with the Gen Cyber Camps, and I know some of those camps have used Common Sense Media materials in their camps. Um, I also really enjoyed learning about the civic online reasoning. Um, so thank you for that. So I am here to talk a little bit about Teach Cyber. Um, and I wanted to say that Teach Cyber is about teaching cybersecurity. When I started in cybersecurity 21 years ago, it was not called cybersecurity. When I started 21 years ago, it was interestingly enough called information assurance and security. And so if you stop and you think about that term information assurance it was a government term, um, it meant, is this information what we think it is? Can we trust it? Can we verify where it came from? And so that very much sounds a lot like what we're talking about when we talk about mis, dis, and mal information to me. So cybersecurity, I think, is certainly about computers, and it's about software, and it's about hardware, and it's about networks. But it's about all of those things, because all of those things are used to transmit, store, and process data and information. And so we moved away from information assurance and security to cybersecurity as we had the information explosion. And along with the information explosion, we had the explosion of the Internet of Things. Right? Because what isn't a computer anymore? <laughs> what isn't using? software and hardware, even if it's just a small embedded system to process, transmit, and store data and information. 
So that's, I think, where we got to the term cybersecurity. So my background um, is in information assurance and security education and now in cybersecurity education. And as, as Nate mentioned when he kindly introduced me, um, I have worked on a variety of projects and actually it's been growing down. When I first started in the field, everything I did was at the graduate education level. And then I saw cybersecurity grow down to the undergraduate level. And then I saw cybersecurity grow to the associate degree level. And now I see cybersecurity growing in high school pretty substantively and in some pockets also in middle school. And I think that that's interesting because it's very much intersecting and, and bootstrapping off of a lot of the good initiatives to teach dig digital citizenship in K-12. So the, the two are not the same, but they're very synergistic efforts. So what I would like you to know about um, Teach Cyber is, is um, just a few things. Um, first of all, I would like you to know that everything that Teach Cyber has done and plans to do in the future comes from suggestions and needs that we get from, from educators. So the first thing that we did that came from a lot of conversations that I had with educators was to create a set of guidelines. These guidelines outline the eight big ideas that we think should be in a high school cybersecurity pathway or a high school cybersecurity course. So we don't call them standards because we are a nonprofit and we can't issue or enforce standards. But what these guidelines are is what should be taught. If you were gonna teach cybersecurity at the high school level, what should you teach? So once we got the guidelines in place, and this is all pretty recent, um, to give you a time frame, we started developing those guidelines in 2019 and spent the entire 2019 year developing the guidelines. We put them through a peer review at the end of 2019 through the beginning of 2020. We revised them and then we published them. This was in collaboration with the National Cryptologic Foundation. So you can find the guidelines on their website, but you can also find them on the Teach Cyber website, which I'll show you in just a minute. So what did we do next? The next thing that we did, which was in response to a conversation with the Maryland State Department of Education was to create modular courseware. So what I mean when I say that it was modular, it's a year's worth of teaching materials. It's built so that it could be sequenced as a year long course. But we also have developed pacing guides that show educators how to use it as a semester long course. And we also know and interact with teachers every day who are just simply pulling a one week unit or two days of lessons and integrating that cybersecurity lesson into their computer science, IT, social studies, English course. So it is used uh, pretty adaptively. So I will say it would be hard to pick something out of unit four or unit five or unit seven without having taught units one, two, and three. Um, unit six is a, is a unit about the economics of cybersecurity. So I think it can be pulled out of its sequence a little more readily. And eight is about policy implications. So I think it can also be pulled out of sequence. Similar to Common Sense Media and the SHEG group, 
Um, our materials are available at no charge to educators. They're Creative Commons licensed, and I'll show you a download in just a minute. Um, so when you download them, you'll get PowerPoint files and Word files, and we did that purposefully to make it pretty easy for you to adapt them if you wanted to, to not just use them, but to modify them. So I, I mentioned that it's pretty, pretty young. Um, the courseware was just made public a year ago. We do grow up by about 100 educators um, a month. We currently have nearly 900 registered users, and we hope a couple of you on the on the Zoom tonight, we'll choose to register. Or if you're not teaching cybersecurity, feel free to share it with another teacher within your school or school district who might be. So of course you can see, we've got guidelines, which is what you should teach. We've got instructional materials, which is how you actually teach it. And the third leg of that stool is assessment. How do we know that learners know what you just taught them? what you want them to know is expressed by the guidelines. So we wrote a National Science Foundation grant that was recommended and funded, and we're just getting started on um, that work. I, I hope to see some of this uh, mature and grow into dual and concurrent enrollment and potentially even placement credit one day. So, Teach Cyber is also involved in teacher professional development. We go the gamut. We do one hour sessions to help people understand a little bit more what cybersecurity is. And we're recently funded as a part of a consortium to offer a 12 credit hour graduate certificate to prepare teachers to teach cybersecurity. And that's what the National Cybersecurity um, teaching academy is it's that 12 credit hour graduate certificate um so future growth for us we're thinking about um, additional pacing guides how to use the courseware in a trimester or a quarter-long course we're looking at a club kit we find that a lot of teachers who get started teaching cybersecurity um, try to grow student interest by having an after-school club we also are just getting started on a multi-state working group to talk about promoting and advancing and advocating cybersecurity education in each of the 50 states. Um, and who knows, maybe through good efforts like this, we might be able to leverage what we're doing into a national information sharing center. So we're a pretty small nonprofit. Um, our, our tagline is change the future, um, teach cybersecurity, change the future. Um, the project is a subsidiary of the nonprofit that I have, Dark Enterprises. And even though we're small, we hope to be, we think we are pretty mighty. Um, so I'm going to get rid of that and just show you quickly the, the website. So if you came to the website and you went up here to teach in order to see those curriculum guidelines, you would come right here. And in order to see some of the actual teaching materials, you would come here under the lessons. And once you're looking under lessons and get the high level overview of the course, um, and then once you come here, you actually just start to navigate the eight units of the course. This particular unit, unit one, what is cybersecurity? We think it's roughly an 11 day unit um, broken down into one, two, three lessons. Here's the title of this lesson and the learning objectives for that out for that lesson it would take days one two three and four 
followed by the CIA triad, which is kind of one of the tried and true frameworks in cybersecurity, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. There are the learning objectives, days five, six, and seven. Um, in the interest of time, because I want to make sure we get to your questions, I'm not going to download one of these, but if I did, you would get kind of a teacher's lesson plan overview, and then you get the actual teaching materials. So you get the not a lot of PowerPoint slides. We try to, our rule of thumb is no more than 10 minutes of talk per class period. So these lessons are full of active learning exercises, worksheets, answer keys, that kind of thing. So I'll stop there and turn it back over to you, Nathan. All right, thank you so much, Melissa. And uh, I just wanna quickly thank all of our panelists for this evening. So can I get a quick round of virtual applause for everyone before we start our questions? <laughs> I hope to see some icons floating up. Um, I think I want to start things off with a quick question um, and, and to kind of help everyone wrap their heads around, um, you know, why we brought these panelists together and, and kind of how they connect into the central concept of the Cyber Citizenship Initiative more broadly. Um, and that's in that, you know, we're really trying to do two things here. One, acknowledging that these kinds of issues are uh, an incredibly complex interdisciplinary set of problems that need different perspectives to address. And two, that by bringing all these resources together, one of our big hopes is that we'll help do the work of identifying gaps in the curricula and places that we need to be moving forward into the future. And I think uh, all of our speakers here this evening have brought to us some truly excellent resources that I highly recommend that all of you kind of go out and take a look at, especially if you're educators, um, for use in your own classrooms. But I think on the other side of that, it does also highlight some of the work that still needs to be done. And one of the key areas that we've kind of outlined as part of the Cyber Citizenship Initiative is this um, idea that we need to kind of foster something that looks like an algorithmic literacy, um, something that might extend past media literacy as it exists currently to help students really wrap their heads around the fact that um, many of the technologies and platforms that they use on a day-to-day -day basis are not simply neutral, that they are themselves kind of driving individuals and users into specific areas and working very hard to maintain attention um, and engagement on these platforms, often irrespective of what that really means in terms of each individual user. Um, and so the question that I want to start out with um, for each of you, because I think um, all of you have a different perspective on how that might work. Specifically, I'm imagining that from the cybersecurity side, we would start developing out more curricula that focuses primarily on the technical elements of the ways in which um, algorithms really engineer and shift attention. And then from the social side, a real examination of how that plays out into things like filter bubbles um, and uh, engagement around very specific ideas and concepts, often in ways that foreclose um, meaningful and, and kind of calm and acceptable forms of discussion. So I kind of want to start there asking all of you if, you, if you don't currently have plans to kind of address these ideas of algorithmic literacy, um, are these things that you might move to incorporate, um, or are these things that you're kind of building out now? So I'll open it up to our panelists. What do you all think? Yeah, I can start with that. I think that's um, definitely a, a an area of growth and of high interest, actually. Um, there's a few key players and I'm, there's one that I, I really, there's a tool and maybe I can think of it and try to share it with you in the chat that it's a game for um, teaching algorithm literacy. And if I can find it, I, I would love to share it with you. Um, I think we are definitely, uh, we're, we're gonna be developing more resources over the next year having to do with news and media literacy and civic engagement. And I think algorithm literacy is one of a core piece of several um, topics that we're looking to address. So for us, that is an area of growth. I will say um, currently the, the sort of um, resources that we do have that are related have to do with how uh, humane technology design and how technology is designed to be humane or maybe inhumane and, and, and having students look at, for instance, the addictive qualities of social media 
or um, really question the tools that they're using, the apps that they're using, and ask themselves a series of questions around humane design. So it's slightly different than a, you know, maybe some of the algorithm literacy frameworks or principles, but it's really helping students do media literacy, which is pulling back the curtain, thinking just what you said, Nathan, that these platforms are not neutral and that they're designed with great intent to get you to use them and, and also to promote addictive qualities to want you to use them. So um, that that's one piece that I think there's a lot of area of growth in terms of algorithm literacy, in terms of um, all of the things that have been going on the past few months with Facebook and TikTok and what is the information that we're being served up or not served up and why and how, how are the platforms designed that way. So I'll pause there and I would love to hear what everybody else is doing. I could certainly speak to some of the ways that we take these up in the civic online reasoning curriculum. One piece of it is that we want students to understand what they see when they do a search uh, and that one of the key moves to become more skilled at finding credible information is to know what to look for when you have a search engine result page or a SERP. Uh, and one of the moves that we saw fact checkers use over and over again was something that we refer to as click restraint. So rather than immediately clicking on the top search result, they take five or 10 or 30 seconds to scroll down to look for what's the best source of information of looking at the snippets about the source, reading the websites, looking for uh, sources that they might already be familiar with. And so that's one of the skills that we teach students. And we really emphasize uh, how Google and other search engines deliver those results, that the top results have nothing to do with credibility um, and have to do with a whole host of, of other things that go into those search engine algorithms. Um, similarly, when we're trying trying to have students become a little better at finding and evaluating information they find on social media sites is to, again, think about what are the algorithms dri driving those websites and that they're pushing for engagement and time on site um, and that we want to, um, to resist some of those things and to rather than immediately clicking on and liking things to take a moment and to think both about who's making those claims and where uh, where's that information coming from. So uh, that those are, are part and parcel with the, the broader approach of helping students to uh, look about, look at and think through uh, the information that they encounter when they go online. Excellent. Melissa, do you have anything to add? I don't. I was sitting here thinking uh, um, what I think algorithmic bias is. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a term that we use much in cybersecurity, but it did remind me of a conversation that I was having with um, a researcher, a computer science researcher at, at Purdue, who was looking at how um, bias is built into computer code. Mm -hmm. um, it, I don't know if you mean it the same way. Do you name exactly? That? Yes, that's exactly what uh, is exactly right. Okay. Okay. And. And I'll add kind of similarly to that, um, and potentially notably for Joel, uh, a lot of my thinking uh, in this space, at least relative to cybersecurity, is actually driven from a keynote presentation that I think happened in 2018 at Black Hat by Alex Stamos, who was formerly the CSO um, at Facebook, but is now actually at Stanford University. Um, and it, I would highly recommend, especially for media literacy educators, um, if you're kind of curious about how cybersecurity in, as a field is thinking about these kinds of problems, um, his talk was really uh, truly excellent and um, notably kind of talked through this idea that cybersecurity needs to take this social shift to pay attention not just to the kinds of technical abuses that we might see, but also to people who are using platforms in ways that are allowable, right, but nonetheless abusive. Um, and that we need to think more broadly about cybersecurity in ways that kind of support those kinds of efforts um, because they are both technical and social at the same time and require really both perspectives to weigh in. Um, and I'll just mention because we just had this in the chat from uh, Michelle, 
If you haven't noticed, uh, she brought up the fact that there is a free Media Literacy Week film festival happening right now. And one of the things that you can watch as part of this film festival is an excellent film uh, entitled Coded Bias. Um, so if you check in the chat, you'll see links to there. Um, and with that, I kind of want to um, shift over. Uh, have we seen any questions in the chat that I, I have potentially missed um, that we want to pick up on? Yes, so we have a question that is directed to Joel. Um, one of the attendees has stated in the um, in the actual message that they sent that there is a crash course um, and the crash course videos that they have seen are excellent. They said, I've used bits and pieces even with my elementary kiddos. Can you direct me to which playlists were curated for Sanford's um, project? I see navigating digital information and media literacy on the YouTube channel? Are the videos connected directly to the lessons or collections? That's the question. <laughs> Thanks so much for that. Yeah, so the, uh, it is the Navigating Digital Information series um, with John Green uh, that is, uh, speaks directly to all the topics in, the, uh, in our curriculum. However, it is not directly linked to lessons. So it's not as though John Green is referring to our lessons, but so uh, for example, there's a whole lesson about lateral reading, that move that the fact checkers use of opening up new tabs to search about an unfamiliar site. We have a bunch of lessons uh, that are about lateral reading. And so you certainly could use those two things in combination that you could have students watch a portion of the video uh, that John Green did regarding lateral reading and then do some of the lessons that we've developed uh, around lateral reading. So they, they work um, hand in glove in that regard. And I'll drop a, a link into the chat to that um, playlist specifically. Great, thank you, Joel. Um, and I, I Jamika, I've, I've actually caught the, the next question here that popped up in the chat. Uh, Miguel Fernandez is asking, um, have there been any cyber citizen or counter slash dis or misinformation um, strategies or materials? And I, I will add to this question also cybersecurity resources and cybersecurity education resources. Um, really aimed at vocational workforce uh, and adult uh, audiences. And I imagine just kind of out of the gate that a lot of your resources here on the panel can be used um, for multiple audiences. Um, and so I, I'd be curious to hear a little bit more about that because this is a common question, at least on the cybersecurity side. Does anyone want to start us off? I will say for Teach Cyber, um, I think that our most common secondary adoption, we're targeted at high school, our most common secondary adoption is actually middle school. Um, but what Teach Cyber is, is it's for people who need an introduction to the, to the field of cybersecurity. So I think it could be adapted for adult learners. What might need to happen is to um, maybe modify, you know, it's built for, you know, a week long 50 minute class periods. You know, so you'd probably just have to adapt that a little bit. Yeah, I, I don't know off the top of my head, Miguel, I think there's a huge need. Um, I think, and it's, you know, I wish I could cite some, I think there's smaller programs that are targeting, um, I've heard of programs targeting high school students or maybe even college to prevent radicalization online. Um, but it's some of these other populations, they're so important and I'm not uh, aware of, you know, direct work. And if anybody is, I would love for you to share it in the chat just so we could share our resources. So I absolutely agree with Miguel and, and Kelly and Melissa speaking to the need for these things. Um, we agree that uh, there's uh, certainly a, a great need for materials for educational settings, but also the, the general public, right? So how can we move from public education to education of the public? Um, and so that that's very much uh, the at the heart of a, a new project that we're undertaking. So we have a partnership with colleagues at the University of Washington, uh, University of North Carolina, and also MIT, and we have a new National Science Foundation 
grant to begin to develop materials to target um, other populations, particularly uh, folks who may be vulnerable to misinformation. So we're, we're starting by doing work in some rural parts of the United States with the idea of trying to create a template that could be used with a variety of different groups um, with the belief that to do that well, we first need to understand those groups and their particular uh, information needs. And so um, we're, we're going to do some, some field work initially to, to work with folks in uh, um, some rural places and, and we'll uh, hopefully have some materials to share by the end of the year and, and an opportunity to expand that work in, uh, in the coming years. All right, excellent. Um, Jamika, are there any other questions that I missed before I kind of launch into some of my own? Apparently no, no more questions. Okay, great. Then um, I think I, I do want to ask the question. Um, so. I'd be curious for all of you, a lot of you have answered some of the questions that I might have otherwise had really focusing on, you know, why these these materials might see some kind of use or um, how are, do you offer professional development opportunities to teachers? I think you've all kind of hit those bullets, but one of the things that I'm left a little bit curious about, can you talk to me about the ways in which the kind of materials that you offer um, really um, provide resources to educators who are otherwise genuinely overwhelmed in their day-to-day -day activities, particularly in our kind of contemporary moment uh, between a pandemic and all other forms of upheaval. Um, if you could talk a little bit about how um, either you're currently addressing that or you plan to address it, um, I think it's one of these issues that is certainly at the forefront of a lot of people's minds lately. Yeah, so we see this definitely with digital citizenship, media literacy, and social emotional learning. Teachers, they believe it's important. They want to do it. I think part of it is they they um, have no time, right? They have no time in the day for all the other stuff they have to do. It's very overwhelming just now coming back, keeping afloat with their subject area, you know, all of the things being thrown at them. Um, so what... What we've done is we do have our sort of more traditional digital citizenship lessons, which we've completely overhauled a couple of years ago to be as easy to turnkey implement as possible for somebody just picking it up and using it. But we've taken a lot of activities or key resources from those and created a whole series of quick activities um, where if you have 10 or 15 minutes, you can teach media literacy, digital citizenship, um, and so we typically have um, start with our great video content and have a video and, and a robust discussion, or we've, we've developed student self-guided experiences where a teacher might um, have them go to stations or send us homework or that kind of thing. So I think what we've done is just taken a lot of our core content, sh short, have shorter, quick activity versions and made it much more um, implementable for teachers who tell us time and time again, they, they want to do it, they have no time. And then in addition, just provide free training um, for teachers on our website or, or ideas on how and where to implement this into different subject areas and so forth. Because I think one of the challenges with these topics is they can be implemented in a lot of different places. And we see a lot of different kinds of imp implementation models. And I think they're all valuable. It, it depends on the school or the district and who's doing the teaching. So um, I can share some of those things in the chat, but I think we're just trying to make resources that are, you know, a teacher can use tomorrow that's easy, easy to do. I'll go next, if that's all right, Joel. By all means. Okay, thanks. Um, I would want you to know four things. Um, first of all, Teach Cyber does a monthly newsletter and one of the features that I like in the monthly newsletter is we do a word of the month. And so we take a concept that might be otherwise kind of hard to understand and we break it down and we try to show teachers where that concept is taught in the curriculum. And so that's one way that we try to give a little bit of pertinent information in a small bite to support you know, a teacher who might not be ready to consume an entire year's worth of materials. <laughs> so we also 
have a monthly virtual lounge that is open to anybody who signs up for Teach Cyber. It's um, the, usually the third Thursday of the month um, from 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and we discuss a variety of topics. It's another way to try to, to bring, you know, a small bit of information just in time to support teachers. Um, we offer for teachers who have been selected for grants from Teach Cyber, um, we offer monthly help sessions to try to get them to get their hands on doing cybersecurity, not just hearing about it, but actually doing it. Um, our website has teacher professional development opportunities. And so all of our virtual lounges, my colleague, Nancy Stevens, who I think is here tonight, um, is gonna do a couple of sessions, one hour Saturday sessions. We put all of our PD up there under the um, PD ses section on Teach Cyber. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to point out on the, on the Teach Cyber website is we try to archive a whole variety of other resources that we think could, would be useful to teachers. Um, so we're always trying, uh, appreciating, I come from a family of public educators, even though I chose to be a university professor, I was never in the K-12 classroom. My dad was a math teacher and then a superintendent. My mom was an English teacher. My sister's still a teacher. My nephew, you know how it runs in families like that. Um, so I, I'm pretty aware of the fact that we need to try to um, help teachers consume verifiable information as readily and easily as they possibly can, and then quickly try to translate that into their teaching practice. Um, so that we try to keep that in mind in everything that we do. Thank you, Melissa. Joel? Yeah, I, I would certainly echo a lot of, of what you all have said first, you know, from the original question, which is the, the challenge that is facing teachers, which is they already have overstuffed curriculum and we're asking them to do something additional. And I think what that means is that it's imperative for all of us to figure out ways to make this as easy as possible for teachers to integrate. What's clear is that if we're going to prepare students to um, navigate the, the online world in which we exist, it can't happen in a one-off session. And the way that we're going to do that effectively is to integrate it uh, across the curriculum. And so one approach that we have adopted is to try to make materials that are tailored for particular classes. So we have um, lessons that are for science classrooms, and we also have made ones for history classrooms. And it's uh, an area of ongoing focus for us is to try to create resources that are applicable to particular content areas so that it is not up to the teachers to adapt it to fit what they're teaching, but rather that we can make materials that are uh, immediately usable by a uh, different subject area teacher. So I just dropped a, a links to a couple of those collections. That's certainly uh, an area that we are gonna be continuing to work on a lot um, over the coming years. All right, great, thank you, Joel. With that, we have about three minutes left. So uh, first, I just want to again, thank all of our panelists for joining us this evening, taking time out of their busy schedules. Thank you so much for making the time. Uh, again, if you've got any virtual applause up there for us, I'm sure we'd all love to see it. Um, and that beyond that, I also want to briefly take a moment to thank our hosts at, at Namley, uh, Donnell and Michelle, thank you so much. Um, and then finally, uh, and absolutely from the bottom of my heart, Jamika Anderson, thank you so much for all the work that you did to organize this panel um, and to otherwise really help all of us in getting everything together and, um, and bringing in all of our excellent panelists. So thank you so much. And thank you all who uh, actually taken the time out of your schedules to join us here this evening. Uh, hope you enjoy the rest of Media Literacy Week and to see you all in some of the other events out there. All right. That's it. Thank you very much, everybody, and hope to talk to you all very soon. Bye-bye.